Psalm 103 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Forget not all his benefits. First song we're going to sing is 10,000 Reasons, because there are so many reasons we should worship our God. Let's stand and sing together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, and the end draws near and the time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship your holy name. It's the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Shall we pray together? Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy towards us. We thank you for the fact that you make the sun rise. It shines on the wicked and the good. And your common grace, Lord, your love for 
the people you made is such that you still hold back your final act of judgment and you give us time of grace where we can turn to you, we can come back to relationship with you and we can become those who once again are in fellowship with you and your son. Lord, we thank you that as we think of the blessings that you have given our souls, the greatest blessing surely is that of forgiveness, of redemption, of being reunited with you in Jesus. But Lord, as we remember those things, we recognize there are so many other things that you do for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have placed us in a body, the church, so that we are not alone in our walk with you. And Lord, while we know that you are sufficient for all things, we know too that you take the lonely and you place them in families. And the, the big family that we're in today, Lord, is your church. Lord, we thank you for the chance to meet, the chance to sing these songs, the chance to remember the great stories of Jesus. Lord, the great narrative of creation, of redemption, and of the return of the King. Lord, we thank you that we are not alone, even as we meet here. Many are meeting elsewhere, faithfully bringing your word, faithfully bringing themselves to thank you for what you've done in their lives. And Lord, we know that even as we uh, hear that happen, there are people sitting in churches, in rooms, in, in spaces, Lord, wherever they meet, who are hearing your word and understanding it for the first time and turning to you in repentance. Lord, we thank you. We do not take that for granted. And we pray, Lord, that as we continue in this service, you would search our hearts. You would both remind us of your love and, Lord, call us back to following you faithfully for your glory. In the book of Mark, it talks about Jesus like this. It says, in the beginning of the gospel of Mark, sorry, I'll start that again. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. He preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, and with you, I am well pleased. I love that phrase, well pleased, because it's still around today. He's well pleased with Jesus. Jesus, his son. When we come to church, we hear some of the same stories again and again and again. But the reason we hear those stories is because those stories are true. So somebody will tell you about that great comeback that Liverpool made once in Turkey where they were like pretty much out of it and they came back and I, I think it was Gerard, wasn't it who got the first goal from some distance and all the rest of it and they'll tell you that story because it was a great moment in history but an even greater moment in history is when Jesus first appeared when Jesus came and in another place John says what he heard and he says also that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus of Nazareth 
a man, grew up as a boy, a man came to be baptized by John. And yet Jesus, so much more than a man, totally God. And that's why he says, you, the voice from heaven is God. You are my beloved son. And with you, I am well pleased. So we're going to sing about Jesus. The first song we're going to sing is one we've sung before. And the second one is a hymn that I'm sure we've sung before as well. We'll pause between them and pray. So this is uh, Fully God and Fully Man. Jesus, he's fully God and fully man. That's really hard to understand. So let me try to explain. Jesus, his word upholds the galaxies, but he babbled like a baby in his mother's arms. Jesus understands the universe, but he had to go to school to learn how to write his name. Jesus walked upon the ocean blue, but his feet got tired and dirty too on the dusty roads. Jesus cried when his friend Lazarus died, but his power brought him back to life when he called his name. He's totally God, totally man, both in one. He's the great I am to save the world, fulfill God's plan. He had to be totally God, totally man. Jesus obeyed his Father perfectly. And we know that's something you and me couldn't ever do. No, no, no. Jesus died to pay for all our sins. Rose to save the ones who trust in him for eternity he's totally God totally man both in one he's the great I am to save the world fulfill God's plan he had to be totally God totally man He's totally God, totally man, both in one. He's the great I am to save the world, fulfill God's plan. He had to be totally God, totally man, totally God, totally man. Totally man. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you sent Jesus. We want to thank you that Jesus remained totally obedient at all times, something that we could never do. We can barely manage it for five minutes at a time. Lord, we thank you that he didn't just show us the way to live. He gave us the way to follow. He brought, the place, he brought us to the place where we can come back to be in your family. And Lord, we thank you that that means that he deserves all honor, all blessing, all glory. And Lord, as we continue to sing, we pray that you would remind us of the great truths of the good news that we have to share about Jesus. Amen. We're going to go straight on and sing the next song. Immortal honors. Sorry. Immortal. 
so long as rest on Jesus' head, my God, my portion and my living bread. In him I live, upon him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction and despair. He is my refuge in each deep distress. The Lord, my strength and glorious righteousness, through floods and flames, He leads me safely on, and daily makes His sovereign goodness known. My every need will supply, nor will his mercy ever let me die. In him that dwells a treasure all divine, and matchless grace has made that treasure mine. That my soul could love and praise him more, his beauty's trace, his majesty adore. Live near his heart, upon his bosom lean, obey his voice and all his will. We're going to read the scriptures now together. I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what's called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself 
is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing another song before we send the children through. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for the word that we have just been able to read. We thank you for the peace that is brought in Christ. We thank you that people who were separated and rejected have been brought into your kingdom. And Lord, we know that you have done this according to your plan laid before the foundation of the world. And Lord, we thank you that that is true. But Lord, as your children, as your people, we have been told we can turn to you and we can make our requests to you. And Lord, we do pray for our nation. We pray for those who are under incredible stress and strain at the moment, lost, with no hope and without you in the world. We pray, Lord, that they would be brought to the place where they see you, they hear what they need to hear to turn and repent and follow Jesus. Lord, we pray for our government as it struggles with the first year of being in power, trying to keep promises that were made, trying to maintain momentum and do things that they hope will help the people of this land. Lord, we pray that you will help them to set the right priorities, not to do things that might get them votes in four years, not to do things that uh, are done out of fear, but to do things, Lord, out of firm principle. And we pray that those that advise them will help them to know when they need to be flexible and when they need to be firm. Lord, you place authorities over us and you bring us peace. And in that peace, we have the opportunity to live our lives, to follow you and to tell others of the hope that we have in Christ. So Lord, we do pray for our government and we do pray for mercy for our government because they need you more than they need anything else. And Lord, we pray too for our town, for our county, for our country, Lord, that so many people who are walking in darkness will again see a great light. Lord, you have done that before in this land. There have been times when this has been a nation very, very clearly heading away from you, and yet you have brought back the word into the hands of the people. You have brought it to the place where people hear of Jesus and they return in huge numbers, recognizing that the lives they've been living are empty, the, lives they have been, the lies they have heard are false, and the truth lies only in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live lives that shine the light that they can come to the city on the hill. We pray that we will be able to tell them, but also show them what it means to trust in the living God. Lord, we pray for our youngsters as they go through to Sunday school in a moment. 
We pray for the leaders of that Sunday school. We pray that they would be able to remind these children of the stories of Jesus, help them to shape their thinking and the framework in accordance with your word, Lord. And may they raise a generation who have every opportunity to turn to Jesus. And Lord, we pray for those children that in their hearts you would open their eyes so that they can see the greatest friend they could ever have, the Lord Jesus, and that they could turn early and follow him. And if they're following him already, they could be encouraged to continue to do so in this world where so many reject him. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that we're not alone, that you send your spirit, and we pray, Lord, that he'll be at work in us now. Amen. Still about Jesus. Come behold the wondrous mystery and the dawning of the King. He, the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. What a contrast. Let's sing together. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. Come behold the wondrous mystery, He the perfect Son of Man, in His living, in His suffering, Never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ the great and sure fulfillment of the law in him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption, See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death the God of life. But no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. What a foretaste of deliverance, how unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when he comes. ask the Lord for help as we come to this scripture. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives light. We thank you that it is able to make us wise 
unto salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray this morning that you will strengthen our faith in the Lord Jesus and remind us of how much we owe you, how many blessings we have received in Christ. Help us, Lord, to remember to give all the glory to you. Amen. There is a couple of verses in here which um, often are used as a memory verse. Uh, probably you could tell me which ones they are. Um, but it's verses 8 and 9, in case you're wondering. And I'm actually going to focus on verses 1 to 10 of this chapter. The, the problem with Paul in Ephesians and Romans is it's difficult to break in and know where to begin and stop. But the two verses you often get people memorizing are, For grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And that, that's quite often memorized by people, and, and there's a reason for it. It's that I think often the focus is it's not works. It's not what we did. It's what he has done. And that's absolutely right. It is indeed not what he did. No, not we did, what he did. Um, and when I was here the other day, I actually used Colossians as a passage to bring some of that out. And in some ways, I could have used Ephesians chapter 1 to bring some of that out because it is still Paul, still the same gospel, and surprise, surprise, it's the same message. But there is a danger when we take the verse like that without looking at the context that we forget some of the meaning of that, those words. And one of the words in there is grace. And grace comes up a few times in this passage. In, in 7, the, the, the bit before what I've just mentioned, it says, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. Grace unmeasured, love untold, as we just sung. So it's worth going back to the beginning of this chapter. We could go further back, and I may refer to chapter 1, to really get the picture of what this grace is about. Because it does say for, and that's like another word for because. Yeah? Okay, so again, if it's there, you've got to ask what it's there for. And this is what it says. It says this, you were dead. That's what it says. You were dead. Dead people don't respond. Dead people don't grow. Dead people can't be made better by giving them an exercise regime. Nothing works. They are dead. But you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. So the, the, the kind of death we're talking about at this point is spiritual death. Dead to God. And we were addicted to trespasses and sins. Now, if you read the New International Version, it uses the word transgression and sin, okay? And it's the idea of crossing a line is a transgression. And, a, a, and, and that means breaking a rule, you know. So whatever the transgression is, it's that. Sin, I think, is more in depth. It's more of the heart. But the, the one leads to the other. If you're rebellious, you'll, you'll test the barriers. You'll, you'll cross the lines. And what it says is, Paul points out, we used to live that way when we followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. In other words, the world and the devil were the people we tended to listen to and we followed them. I sometimes see 
students who arrive in a school and they, they turn up the first day in perfect uniform and they look quite whatever. <coughs> and then after a few days, they change. And they look a bit scruffy, they start answering back, their parents are probably shocked, especially if they come from uh, another culture that suddenly they're like this. But what they've done is they started following a certain type of student. They've got in with the wrong crowd and they've started to do things to impress them. And so what they're doing is they're literally following the ways of the world in which they live. They're in their little bubble and they said, this is what other people do, I'll just do the same thing. So without realizing it, these kids are in some cases literally bringing shame on their parents. And it's quite interesting when you have a conversation with one of those parents sometimes that when they actually have the conversation, they're like, but you know this is wrong. And the child's like, yeah, I do. But it does depend upon who you associate with as to what happens. The thing, though, is that Paul says elsewhere, he tells the Corinthians this, we cannot take ourselves out of the world. We can't do it. We're not going to completely isolate ourselves you know, we'll all buy an island and go live there or something. By the way, people have tried that and it never worked. They always bring sin with them, so it, it never works. But by nature, not just by action, we are disobedient. You see, the, the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, is the same liar that told Eve that it would be okay to touch the tree, or eat the apple, not apple, sorry, fruit. Um, nothing has changed. But what the answer is for us is we need to change, but I'm afraid I've got some bad news. Dead people don't change. They don't get up and walk away. Well, Lazarus did, but that was Jesus doing that. Jesus did, and that's the Father raising him. But usually, that doesn't happen. And the picture here is very clear. That whilst we were living, we were also dead. We lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, allowing its desires and thoughts, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Addicted to sin. Believing the lies. Disobeying God's laws literally a world running away from its creator and we were in that crowd paul doesn't say just you guys he includes himself because he says we and paul himself would have said did say he wrote it in timothy i was the worst of sinners i was there killing the people who were telling other people about jesus i was the worst of sinners and yet God reached out and saved me. And the thing is that we were incapable of making a change for ourselves. Unless we were given life again, unless we were, the Bible sometimes uses the word quickened, then we could not change. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. That's what Wesley wrote. Thine eye, that's God's eye, diffused a quickening ray, a sort of a ray of light, but actually a quickening ray, a ray that gives life. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. That's a hymn that we often sing, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? But what he's describing is what needs to happen, or we are just dead. So when it says, by grace we are saved, it means because we could do nothing and it is all of God. It is God's grace and God's mercy. And unless God 
made the first move to reconcile us to him, it was never going to happen. We would just be heading for hell, highway to hell. If you take a picture of, I was going to say somebody on a boat that sunk, but that is illogical. I mean somebody who was on a boat, but it sunk, don't I? Uh, you imagine somebody in, in, in the ocean, and there's, there's several people, and you're one of them, and this helicopter swoops down, and some guy on a rope comes down, grabs you, pulls you out of the freezing cold North Sea, and t the helicopter takes you and plonks you on the deck of a ship where somebody puts a blanket around you and starts to warm you up and so forth, while the helicopter heads off to try and rescue somebody else. Do you have any reason to feel that you are superior to the people who are still in the water? Do you have any reason to think that you're better than them because you're on the boat and they're still in the water? Of course not. But there is a danger that these verses that we originally talked about memorizing are trying to deal with, which is this. It says it's not our work that did it. You did not fly out of the water as if you were some superhero and land yourself on the boat and shake off the water and suddenly look perfect. You did not do that. You were rescued. So you can't boast that you're better. In fact, you should instead, I suspect, feel concern, grief, sorrow for the people who are still in the water. Shouldn't you? That's the picture that we have to get. We were just like everyone else, dead in our sin, dead in our transgressions, completely unable to relate to God, and in fact, his enemy. But, verse 4, but, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What happened was that God made the first move. He sent Jesus. That Jesus who walked up to John and said, baptize me. And in one of the other Gospels, he said, I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy to baptize you. No, it has to be done. Because I'm obeying God. And when Jesus was baptized, yes, the heavens opened. Yes, God said, you are my beloved son, who I sent down there. And with you, I am well pleased because you're doing what we planned. Just a few verses later, Jesus is tempted in the desert. And when he comes out, the first thing he does is to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And when you look at the Gospels, when you look at how Jesus deals with people, people who are lost and without hope in the world, he's always reaching out to offer them the chance to turn again towards God. But like Lazarus, his friend who died and who was stinking by the time he got there because dead people don't always look good. They do when you embalm them and they're ready, but after that they decay. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus shouldn't have been able to do that, but it was only because Jesus called him that he could because Jesus has that power. God has that power. According to both before and after, some of the verses point out that Jesus made peace by his blood. Jesus who died and who God raised, 
Jesus who walked amongst his disciples and then ascended into heaven. So he's bodily in heaven and seated on the throne. But with us by his spirit, Jesus, by his grace, by God's grace, has paid the way for us to become back and become part of God's household. It's an incredible cost, and we could spend a long time just looking at those verses. But if you flick back to chapter 1, not only does this chapter say we are seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ, so spiritually we're already with him, it talks about the incredible riches that we have. And this is what it says in verses 3, 4, 5. I'm just going to read those. No, 7 is it's so difficult. Start. 3, 4, 5, 6 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. It's a bit like Psalm 103, isn't it? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places where spiritually we're seated with him. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world so that we would be holy and blameless before him instead of dead and stinking. He, in love, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And it's so easy just to keep reading about it being lavished on us and so forth. Do you get the picture? We once were not, but now we are. We once were that, but now we're not. If I bought some apples and I went and hung them on some random tree out there, would that make it an apple tree? Not unless I randomly picked an apple tree, but the apples that I hung on there wouldn't make it an apple tree because that's not real. But if I came along and apples were growing on the tree, I would know it's an apple tree. Right? Jesus said you can tell a tree by its fruit. You can tell eventually what somebody's life is like by the fruit of what they are. But you can't make a tree into something it isn't by sticking on the fruit. Now, if you think of the works that, that we're talking about here, one picture that might help you is the works don't make the tree. The tree does the works, okay? The apples aren't what makes the tree, but if apples come out of a tree, it's because it's an apple tree. So the fruit shows you. Does that make sense? Okay, so I can never, ever do anything that is enough to get myself out of that desperate situation that I'm in in the North Sea and fish myself out. I can't do it. I need somebody to reach down and grab me and take me out. That's grace. And God did that through Jesus for everyone who will believe in him. He paid that price. He sent him. He's the rescuer. There's actually a song, isn't there? Super Saviour to the Rescue. I won't sing it, don't worry. But the point is that we couldn't do it, but he did. So when we read on in chapter 2, which I'm trying to focus on, I apologize, there's just so much good stuff elsewhere. God raised us up. We were dead in our transgressions, but now we are alive. The gospel ray, if you like, somebody put that in one of the, the, the versions of the hymn book. It, it hit us, we, it lit us up, we suddenly became alive. Our dead heart became a living heart. Our eyes were opened and we saw again. We saw. 
and we followed. And there's a word at the end of that passage that I just read. It says, to the grace of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is not just some kind of transactional thing. This is adoption. This is being brought into a loving family. I have a friend, well, we have a couple, a whole family, and they adopted a young girl who'd had difficult circumstances and was just a toddler. And this young lady, she's grown up really well, really blessing. But the first time they went on holiday and they packed this little girl's suitcase, she got really upset. And, and when they went on holiday together, she stayed with the suitcase. She wouldn't let the bag go because she had been so used to being bounced from place to place to place. And when she came home, she went upstairs and she checked out her bedroom and then she relaxed because she realized it was the same and this really is home. Now I think as Christians we sometimes because we look at ourselves and we recognize that we haven't completely stopped singing. We haven't completely got everything right. We still get angry. We still do things wrong. We still lose our rag. We still think thoughts we shouldn't be thinking. We still say things we shouldn't do. We still forget to do things we should do. We forget that God's lavish grace, God's love, means that we are still his. We are still seated in the heavenly realms. We are still blessed. But of course, one of the other things that you would see in that young lady is that she doesn't act out like she used to. She has her moments, all kids do. But she doesn't act out like she used to. She knows that she is love and she responds back. And she feels completely accepted with her big brother and sister in that family. And that comes with time sometimes. But we have to remember that. Now, I don't think there's any way in which she would say, I'm special because I'm in that family and I'm something different than everybody else. But I think that there would be a real sense of belonging to that family, which would be right. So there's, there's nothing wrong with feeling like you belong in the church of God and belong in God's family, as long as you do and as long as you believe in Jesus. But those two pictures I've given you may help us as we come back to the verses that we nearly reached. Verse 7. He raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Incomparable riches. I know they're moaning about Prince Charles and Prince William at the moment having, one's got the Duchy of Cornwall and one's got the Duchy of Lancaster or something, I can't remember. But apparently they, they, they've got a lot of money. But nothing compared to the lavish riches that God has and the grace expressed in his kindness to us in the beloved Lord Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. When you believed, when you heard, and when your heart was changed by the Spirit, and when you turned to God, he changed you. It wasn't anything you had done. It wasn't whether you'd got 10 stickers and managed to turn up to 10 Sunday schools. Is that still a thing it used to be years ago? It, it wasn't that you could sing all the tunes. It wasn't that you could answer the questions. It was that you believed and you were rescued by God. And why does that matter in our day-to-day -day life? Because it means that when something goes well, 
I should look up and say, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because that went well, despite me. I once was told that by a lovely lady in our church called Beryl, who came to me and said, your, your, son, your son has turned out really well, despite his parents. <laughs> so good. But actually, in a way, it's true, because you look at your kids sometimes and you think, I've passed on that fault. I've passed on that bad habit. I've done that wrong. And yet somehow, by God's grace, they turn out and they grow past that. And that is because, actually, it's not just us. As a parent, I'm so relieved the fact that I can sometimes go to the Lord. And not only that, as a parent, I, I, I'm relieved that over time, in the church I was in, there were kids a little bit older who sometimes would tell my son, well, actually, my dad did that to me and it didn't do me any harm. So at one point, I, this is a bit old because, of course, you've got phones these days. Do you remember the little um, Nintendo DSs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have to save up some money towards your Nintendo DS. So he goes off to the youth group and he complains. And this kid who's a year old and thinks, yeah, that's what I had to do as well. You know, suck it up, do it. <laughs> and they take it from their friends. Or sometimes they tell you something their friend's dad had told them. And you think, but that's what I told you. But because it comes from somebody else, they'll listen. It's just kids. It's just the way it is. It's fine. But actually, in the end, I don't really mind as long as he grew up as a godly young man, as somebody whose faith is in Jesus. Because that's important. And he grew up as well knowing that despite his parents being a bit weird, they love him. And that, I think, is the most important thing for children to know that they're loved and accepted. But it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. Even the faith is a gift of God. And it's not by works. It's not by sticking on the apples that changes the tree. What changes it is the fact that it is what God has done. And when God changes you, then everything changes. And we should not boast about ourselves. We should boast about what God has done. But that doesn't mean, just in case you think it does, that we don't have to do good stuff. Because an apple tree, by its nature, produces apples. Yeah? That's what it does. It's what it is. Jesus got really upset with a fig tree once when it didn't. Do you remember that? <coughs> that was an illustration of something to do with Israel, which is a totally different story, but it, it brings out the same idea that it's about the fruit that comes from who you are. And who you are is what God has made you. Because this is what it says. We are God's handiwork. We're God's work. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when we follow Jesus, when we do the things that please him, when we do good works, it's fruit of who we are in Christ. It is not what makes us who we are in Christ. It's a sign that we are that. Does that make sense? So it's the cart and the horse. You can't make yourself right with God through what you do. But if God in his mercy has adopted you into his family, you want to please your father. So you'll do the right things. And that is the organic way in which the church grows. The big work of the church is to be the people who are seeking to be holy because God is holy, but who love God with all their heart, their mind, their strength, and love their neighbor as themselves. We go out and we reach out to others. Now, I have a quote that I'm going to just look up on this piece of paper because it is important sometimes to read things accurately. Uh, so let me just open up. There it is, I hope. Yes. So... A politician called Kate Forbes, you may remember Kate Forbes, she's still about, um, Scottish politician, came under a huge amount of attack 
um, when she ran to be the replacement for the SNP leader because of her Christian faith. And a lot of people, when they see people who attend church or profess faith in Christ, they somehow view them as people who are holier than thou. In other words, looking down on people. Now, this verse tells us we shouldn't be doing that. But people who think they should have something to boast about because of who they are. So, more Trumpian than Christian. Trump's always boasting about himself. But it shouldn't be true of real Christians, although it will still be accused. But this is, this is what Kate Forbes, a Christian, was interviewed by LBC's Ian Dow. Now, I didn't realize this about Ian Dow until he said it. But he asked her whether he is a sinner in the eyes of her church because he has a husband. Okay? So her response was clear. I consider you as much of a sinner as I consider myself to be a sinner. Remember, we all were that. And I'm taught to believe that you're of greater value than I am and that I'm to serve you. So what she's saying is I'm not going to reject you on the basis that you're a sinner because I'd have to leave the world. I'm going to serve you because of God's love. It's a strange thing, isn't it? But it does make sense when you think about it. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So you don't disconnect yourself from the lost, otherwise how are you ever going to reach out and save them? He came to live among the lost, but he didn't accept their morals, necessarily. And this woman, the reason why she was criticized was the fact that she said she, she still believed in marriage, she wouldn't have a child outside of marriage. And, and then she made it very clear that came from her Christian faith. And that it's, it's perfectly right to be willing to give a reason for your faith and for your belief and so forth. So I just thought I'd bring that out as an example of humbly holding the truth without boasting that we're better than you in some way. And remember that old phrase, there but for the grace of God go I? It is literally true. If we are not saved by grace, still dead in our transgressions, still lost and without hope in the world. This is what it says. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It is by grace we have been saved through faith, not our own doing, completely the gift of God, not a result of works. So we don't need to boast in anything except the cross of Christ our Lord. But let me point out to you one other thing that means. If I'd had a really good day, done everything right, got up, had a quiet time, you know, done this, done that, done, you know, set the dishwasher going for the wife before I left the building, everything really going well. And somebody said to me, Martin, I, 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 I've noticed that you're a Christian. Could you talk to me about what that means? Would I need the grace of God to be able to help that person? Yes, of course. Supposing I'd had a really bad day and I'd had an argument with, I don't have a cat actually, but you know, I'd had an argument, I'd forgotten to turn on the dishwasher, the bins weren't taken out, I only just got into work in time, it was just really a bad day and I'd been really grumpy all day as well. And this guy comes up to me and says, Martin, I've noticed you're a Christian. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Do I say, I've had a really bad day today, come back another day? Or do I still turn and talk to them, relying on the grace of God? And the answer is still the same. I still do exactly that. You're not a Christian because you had a good day today. You're not a Christian because you, you, you're not not a Christian because you had a bad day either. It doesn't work like that. You are still part of the family. Now, people in the family can be sent to their room and disciplined, 
but they're still part of the family. They're still loved, really, yeah? Our parents disciplined us as they saw fit. But we must remember that we are loved and that when we turn and say, Lord, I just completely blew that, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is grace, unmeasured, love, untold. He has you because you are adopted as his. It is by grace. It's not what we did. It's what he has done and what he continues to do. And when he works through us, as he delights to do and shows his kindness through us, the glory goes to God. Aren't we so blessed? Well, I've run over very slightly, so I'm going to stop and we're going to pray and then we're going to sing our final song, which will be, He Will Hold Me Fast. Let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that it is by grace that you have reached out and you have saved us. Lord, we pray that if that isn't true for somebody in this room because they have not yet turned to you, that they would do so. And that if they don't know how, they would just have the courage to ask. And we'll show them a few pages of the Bible and explain it to them. But Lord, we know that it's a work of grace in the heart. Help us to be reminded, Lord, that you, as our Father, have adopted us as your sons, have placed us in Christ in the heavenly realms, and that, Lord, we have nothing to fear. Help us too, Lord, to respond to that love by loving you back and by loving our neighbors as ourselves. And, Lord, especially by being willing to tell them of our hope in you. Lord, we thank you that you one day will return and bring us all to be with you, and this will all be so much clearer. But in the meantime, Lord, we know that the work of the church is to be a light and to tell others of Jesus. Help us, Lord, in our lives this week to both rely on you, remember you, and be ready to tell others of our hope. Amen. When I fear my faith will fail. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for my Saviour loves me so, He will hold me fast. Those He saves are His delight, Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost, his promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for
for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight, when he comes at last. He will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Saviour loves me so, he will hold me fast. And I think it would be appropriate today to finish by saying the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fellowship of God, and the love of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>